Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, Jonathan Macri, with you for another edition of the Knicks Film School podcast. Uh, we are recording this at uh, one o'clock on what's today? Is today Wednesday? Yeah, let's go with Wednesday. Um, so uh, we do not yet have in the in the books today. Actually, I don't even know if there's going to be a press conference today. Let's pretend there's a Knicks press, press conference today. We don't. Uh, have in the books uh, Tom Thibodeau not giving us an injury update on OG Ananobi and slash Julius Randle. So we won't be able to talk about that. Although I am going to pester today's guest with all sorts of nonsense and um, I'm going to I'm going to try to get under his skin. You know why? Because I'm in a shitty fucking mood because the Knicks have lost three games in a row. And I'm going to take it out on the only guy who I want to take it out on. And that's Fred Katz of The Athletic and of uh, Katz and Shoot, of course. Hello, Fred. John, you could never get under my skin. <laughs> I think we could both get under Andrew's skin. <laughs> oh man, I really but expect the Pistons to, to give more down the stretch of this lost season. Is what is what I think we should talk about for the next. I know minutes. that's true. That's true. I, I I think we should honestly just talk Pistons the the whole time. Just see what happens. Did they lose to the Grizzlies? Right in their last game, I think. If I'm maybe imagining that, don't ask John. Even I, even I'm like I, I, I can't talk Pistons Grizzlies. You're a fraud. I can't do that. You're I, what I, a fraud. You are. I can't. I can't talk Pistons Grizzlies. I'm sorry. You claim I to can't. be a right and true believer in the in Detroit basketball, and you don't even know if they won their. No, I don't. I claim to be the exact opposite. That's I'm true. the you exact opposite of a tried and true believer. What are you talking about? Uh, yes, they did lose to the, be far to the Grizzlies. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Um, how you doing, uh, Fred? So you're you're in New York. You tweeted it last night, or you you re- in replies that you were not in Miami for the game, but uh, you nonetheless are are familiar with the the goings on. Um, let's start here. Uh, I, you know, oftentimes this season and last season, you'd come on here and the Knicks would be doing whatever they're doing and would not be an ideal is in as ideal a position as you know, fans would like them to be. And you, without fail, I think, come on this podcast and you're like, it's fine. Everything's fine. They're doing fine. They're playing well. Like, you're going to lose some games sometimes. It's a long season, yada, yada, yada. I, as a reporter who has been beating the door to them to finally acknowledge reality, for the better part of the last month, and you finally kind of got your way. We can, we'll talk about it, but like we're you're covering this team where there's this uh, giant unknown that hovers over everything. How would you feel about the Knicks if you were a Knicks fan and had an interest in rooting for this team to win basketball games moving forward? I would feel incomplete. Uh, look at you. I, I, I would feel like the group that's out there is doing everything that it possibly can. And I would feel that this team was not supposed to make a playoff run. This team plus Julius Randall and OG Ananobi is supposed to make a playoff run. And if there's no OG Ananobi, and there's no Julius Randle, I would feel, you know what? I'm going to change and complete. I would feel unsatisfied. I would feel like, I would, you know what I would feel, John? I would feel blue balled. Mm-hmm. I would feel like they tickled me in January. Oh my God. It all went great. And then they just, they just left. And that's how that's how I would feel. So I under <laughs> I like the tickled as the you could have love, gone with a, a, a dozen verbs there. And the fact that you went with tickled, I think said, well, you know what? We don't have to talk about what that says about you. Um, but no, I, I <laughs> continue, please. No, I think I understand the frustration. And part of the reason why I understand the frustration is because I don't think there's a good target for the frustration. There's not actually like a person to be frustrated with, you know, like it's 
Well, you can you can say what you want to say on that. I would say no, you, you don't know who I'm going to refer to, but can continue. OK, to my at this point, before you've convinced me that there is, I don't believe that there is really a person to be frustrated with. There's a situation to be frustrated with. You're not going to be frustrated with Jalen Brunson. You're not going to be frustrated with Josh Hart. You're not going to be frustrated with Miles McBride. Nope. You're not going to be frustrated with Dante DiVincenzo or Isaiah Hartenstein. You're going to be frustrated that Isaiah Hartenstein is playing on a on a minutes limit with Achilles tendinopathy for two straight months, where the Mitchell Robinson is dealing with ankle injuries and can't really play, or that OG Ananobi has played three games in the last two plus months, or that Julius Randle hasn't played since January 27th. Like that's that's where the frustration is going to come, and that's where these losses come. Maybe you know what? I take it back. You're going to say Alec Burks and Boyan Bogdanovich are the people no. frustrated with. Oh. No, no, no because. Say? Because they're both players in their mid-30s and they went from a, the worst situation in the league to a situation that was quite different. And, you know, they haven't been able to adjust. Like, shit happens. You know what I'm frustrated with, Fred? I'm frustrated with you. <laughs> and do you know why that is? Because I no, sat here. Me. I sat here on this podcast. I, man, I think it was, I should know this. Maybe Andrew will remember. I think it was after the Miami game. So after the, after certainly the Julius injury. And um, obviously we didn't know what we know now about the OG thing. Um, even if it was before though, no, it had to be after it had to be after because I asked you, Fred Katz of the athletic and Katz and shoot fame. Like, is there like, is there any world where, the the Knicks can like go, bow out in the first round of the playoffs, and it would be seen internally as like okay, a lot of shit happened. Maybe we ran into maybe the wrong team or whatever, fought hard. And you, I believe, said to me like, no, this team thinks it should win a first round series, and they are going to be massively disappointed. I don't know if that was exact your exact words, but something along those lines, right? If they do not win a first round series, and. So the reason I'm frustrated with you, obviously I'm being a little bit facetious here, but like I never jumped over the chasm of this team is a genuine true blue championship contender this year. Thus, I'm not all that bummed out about what's happening right now. Do I feel some frustration? Was it really cool to see January? Could this team give, if they're healthy, give Boston a real run for their money? Sure. I don't think anyone's beaten Denver. I'm just going to put that out there right now. But like, I'm more concerned about next year and the year after that and, you know, the year after that, however long it is, because I think that is when, as I've said this to Jeremy on our pod, that is when the window is open, like fully open, as opposed to now where it's maybe like just the slightest little crack open. And so I just want to get like, I want to put all this messiness behind us and I want to enter the post, the, the off season, excuse me, with just like good vibes, you know, and maybe that's impossible with these injuries, regardless of what they do in the playoffs. But like, I just would like to go and be like, okay, it's fine. We have proof of concept. We know what this team is capable of doing if they're healthy. We'll see what they do with trades in the offseason. And I, I, I have had this hanging over my head now for I feel like two months where it's like, no, they have to get out of the first round. Otherwise, James Dolan is going to rampage on into Leon Rose's office and say, you promised me X, Y, and Z. Whose job do I have to take away? Because you didn't get like, that's where I'm at mentally. And maybe this is because of three straight losses, but I, that's what I, that's what I'm coming back to you with, Fred. I think you're a few too many steps ahead. Okay, that's I. It's not the first time. Like when I when I when I said that, and I did say that. You did say that, okay. but, and, and I have said that I've written many times that this front office has aspirations beyond just winning a playoff series. But I think those aspirations are are contingent upon actually having their roster. Fine, Th you know, and that's like like if they if they have a hard fought series against Orlando and they lose, cause they just don't have the talent and Randall doesn't play and OG and nobody doesn't play. Then I don't know how the organization is going to handle that. I honestly, I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't tell the future. I could see them being upset. I could see them not being upset. I could see them kind of being upset, but more just kind of using that they were a first round out as an excuse to do something else. Like I, I, I don't know which way they're going to go. If Randall comes back and he doesn't look like himself at all, I don't know how that will affect it. If, if they have a good run and Randall comes back with three games left in the regular season and Anobi comes back with four games left in the regular season and those last four, they win in Boston and then, and then they, they look like the January Knicks to close it out and they win and, you know, and then all of a sudden they, 
blow a three, one lead to the magic or the Pacers in the first round, then we're talking That's like, they're going to be like, this is some, some bad crap, yeah. but I don't know. I don't know how it's going to go with the roster as constituted. And one thing that, man, I just, I feel like such a broken record. I've said it so many times. I've written it so many times and it's just the, the Knicks are so opaque about their injury timetables. Yeah. And we just don't know. We just, we just don't know. And I think with Ananobi, they must have a better idea than they're putting out there. I think with Randall, I think it really is just like a, they're 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 playing it by ear and really hoping for the best. And Randall is pushing really really hard to to want to play regardless. Can I ask you an inside baseball question? You can ask me whatever you like. You're you're very nice. I'll quote, I'll, nice quote I'll quote uh, I'll quote Evan Fournier. You can ask me whatever you want. I'll decide if I want to answer. <laughs> I so miss Evan. Evan was always good. Yeah, he said that to me once. I said, can I can I ask you a basketball question? <laughs> or a nerdy basketball question? He said, you can ask me whatever you want. I'll decide if I want to answer. Do you think he's... Inter- Sorry. I, I I know. I This is actually not a joke. Gun to your head. Don't think too hard about it. Do you think Evan Fournier is in an NBA rotation next year? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. We'll leave it at that. Oh, we're talking about the Pistons again. We're going to, that's like, exactly. I, we'll leave it at that. I, we're do, not, no I think I, I think wherever he goes is knowing him he's just been so disappointed in not playing for the last two years i think he will specifically go Goes anywhere as long as they are willing to play him okay that's that's good enough pistons talk enough 48 talk um inside baseball question when you who you i don't know if you, you kind of joke about it or you don't give yourself enough credit uh i don't think at least who are one of the most connected reporters out there covering any team um see a Woj or a Shams, uh, your colleague Shams, I should say, at the Athletic, uh, tweet or report something like we saw within the last few days w- uh, about OG Ananobi, b- like being sooner on the on the timetable with like Julius. How do you, Fred Katz, reporter for the Athletic, engage with that with seeing something like that? Like, what do I do behind the scenes? Sh- I mean, sure, if you feel comfortable sharing that, yeah, yeah, I. I- I ask people in the know. I, I hit up people who are in the know who either have a track record of helping me or who I know know things and and ho- I hope will will lead me on the right path. Just like, hey, Woj reported this thing. You know, with Shams, it's different. Shams is my colleague. I could just call yeah. up Shams and be like, what's going on? And he and I talk. Uh, but with with you know, when Woj reports something on that, I'll I'll hit people up and I'll try to get try to get an idea of you know, what exactly that means. I, I'm not big on, I've probably done it because it's human to do it, but, but theoretically I'm not huge on like, there is, there is optimism that it could be this potentially if these three things happen, according to sources. Here. you know, like I'm just, I'm not, not yeah. huge on that. I kind of want something more concrete than that. And and sometimes, sometimes like it's 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 to quote Tibbs, it's all medical. And sometimes all medical is like, you know, like you 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 may be a normal person who breaks their arm and you go to the doctor and the doctor's like, well, you know, you could be out of the cast in three weeks, you could be out of the cast in six weeks. We want to see, we want to see how long. This is going to go for him. We want to see how you respond. Maybe it'll be a little bit longer. Like these things are a play by ear basis, but in terms of reporting it, I try to have something that's a little more concrete than just like they're hopeful that maybe one day, either in the near future, immediate future, or distant future, that he could resume contact and then after he does contact work it could take anywhere from three hours to three years before he gets back onto the court uh and if he gets back onto the court he will have a minutes restriction 
uh, between 15 minutes and 27 minutes. Uh, if he, if Tibbs goes over it and plays him 34, he's going to have to sit for the next eight games. Uh, so, so we'll, we'll see. And then he has his 57th birthday after that. So, so we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens. I just, I, I'm not, not huge on it just cause I don't find it. I don't find it that informative. So when I hear that kind of stuff, sometimes I'm just like, I just kind of leave it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And that makes a lot of sense because if as someone who pays very close attention to everything that you tweet, you don't do yeah. to be, to be clear, by the way, I don't find it unethical. Like I'm not, I'm not, it's not like journalistic well, malpractice. I just don't find it particularly informative. And it's, I don't know that it's been particularly helpful or useful for Knicks fans to engage with that sort of stuff over the last two months, because it's like, I think people are going a little stir crazy where it's like, like, what could we just fucking know what the hell is going on? And like, again, as you kind of alluded to with the, it's all medical, like there's a chance they just don't know. Um, but I, it's hard to view all of this that's been going on with anything other than a skeptical eye, especially with the tip. And I, again, I know you weren't in front of him when he said it, but you, you saw, you, you saw him say it, what he said about Julius, which is like, he needs to get comfortable with essentially he, said he needs to get comfortable with being uncomfortable with how he plays or getting uncomfortable with like that, which I'm like, all right, well, how does he do that if he's not taking contact? And is it like, is, are we saying it's like a mental thing? Like he needs to be okay. But, but then it's like, well, clearly this guy's rare to get back on the court. So I don't know if it's a mental thing like that confused me. And again, maybe I'm just reading way too much into it. But I don't know what, how we're supposed to make heads of tail heads or tails of any of this at this point. More with Julius, I guess. Now the reporting on OG is like it's it, there, it's it seems like it's going to be better before the end of the regular season. I I don't know. So pick on either of those that you want. Right. To- totally. Because the Knicks' optimism of fill in the blank is just always correct. It's Mitchell Robinson's not missing time with the ankle. The ankle's totally good. And then there's surgery. It's yeah. uh, OG Ananobi is, is back on this date and then he's having soreness, but there is no injury. It's just the normal bumps and bruises. And then now he's missed eight consecutive games and they just changed the designation to uh, tendinopathy in his elbow, which is an injury. And is something and is something that that bone spurs can aggravate. So there are there's just. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's it's my job to say things that I know it's 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 my job to know as much as I possibly can. But some things are unknowable and I just don't really know. You know, the Knicks also said when Ananobi first sat for the second time that they were being like, it's not going to be long. Yeah. And now it's been two and a half weeks. So you just, you just, you just don't know. I, I, I think you just kind of have to be comfortable not knowing in terms of Randall. I think what Tibbs was getting at when he said that, and like you said, I wasn't there, so I couldn't ask a follow up to it. But I think what Tibbs was getting at when he said that is what Randall's rehab process has been is his shoulder because he didn't have surgery. His shoulder is at a higher risk than you would want mm-hmm. to be re-dislocated upon contact. And so what so much of his rehab process has been is strengthening the muscles and the tendons around his right shoulder okay. so that they can hold it in place more capably. And I think what Tibbs was getting at with that is those muscles need to be in the most tippy top shape they can possibly be in. So he doesn't get like bumped on the shoulder and all of a sudden the thing dislocates it, again and he has to do something else are, are they giving him kind like, of talked about that before are they giving him like regular mris like how do you know if that is happening that's actually a great question <laughs> that's right that's what i was wondering I, it's like, yeah i don't know you know what i'm gonna ask that i don't know <laughs> don't get me that's a, that they might be that's totally possible that they're giving him regular mris that's in the i mean there's an mri machine right there yeah you know, they got okay. one in their practice facility. So well, yeah, that's totally possible. That that might be exactly what they're doing. Or it might just be based on like, you know, 
how how much resistance can you stand with bands and work with bands or That's, weight sure. or things like that? It could just sure. be as simple as simple as that. Okay, Julius, can you? We're doing this work with the band. We set the resistance really high. Are you able to lift it enough? Are you able to move your arm out enough? Are you able to move your arm in enough? Are you able, like, are you able to do that kind of stuff? And if he's not passing those tests, then they're like, okay, well, the muscles aren't aren't strong enough. It could just be as simple as that as well. But that's a that's a good question. I'm gonna ask I'm gonna ask that to Tibbs. I'm curious what he says. I'm sure um, he won't answer, but I would love to know the answer. People think I ask questions because I just like already know the answer. And you ask, no, I the, when I ask a question, it's because I don't I want to know the answer. That's why I ask a question. So I would love to know the answer to that. Um back to OG for a second. Uh you were, I, I believe, in front of Josh Hart when he spoke after the Thunder game, right? About the I was at the game, but I was not in the Josh Hart scrum. But oh, you're not know the, the quote Josh you're about to talk about. Okay. Well, you know the quote for anybody who may have missed the quote. Josh Hart basically said we're going to go about uh the rest of the season as you know, I'm I'm approaching the rest of the season as if the guys that are not here are not going to be back and we'll go to war with what we have. Um and I couldn't help but think back to that. After I read your piece today, uh, well, today, Wednesday, it dropped on how the Knicks, for as much as there has been a lot of talk about the refereeing lately, are really embracing the level of physicality that um, is now allowed, I guess is the right word to say, in the league, and that it could, it could potentially bode well for them moving forward in the playoffs because they're a team that like likes to get down and dirty. They lost to another team last night that likes to get even even lower and dirtier. Um, but most teams are, are don't exist in that, in that place. And Josh Hart maybe is the epitome of that. You got a great quote from Josh Hart in the story in which he talked about, like for me, like this is, this is fucking great. Um, and I thought about that because like he is, he's out there giving it his all. He's obviously averaging over 40 minutes a game. Now going back close to 30 games, the next game, I think if he plays over 40 minutes, it'll be, it'll push his average to over 40, 40, 30 game sample size, which is insanity in the NBA today. Do you, do you get the sense that he or anybody else for that matter is frustrated? And I, I want to, I, I, I don't mean to be vague with that word, but like you could get where I'm going with, with this. I think, if I think if there's one thing that we all, and you don't need sources and you don't need a personal relationship with Josh Hart in order to say this, I think if there's one thing that is very apparent about Josh Hart, it's that if he were frustrated, he would just flat out say that he was frustrated and say why. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think he would be speaking in code. Okay. He has never spoken code about anything else. When he's frustrated about his lack of minutes, he complains about his lack of minutes. When he's frustrated about too many minutes, he complains about too many minutes. When he's frustrated about not getting touches, he complains about not getting too many, not getting enough touches. When he, he, he and and he does it to himself. When he can't hit shots, he complains about how he can't shoot. And when you when you, it's just he 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 has about less of uh, about as little of a filter as I can really think of. So I'm not going to put words in his mouth okay. and, and say that I, 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 especially with that guy, you know, oh, that's, that's but, good. But I'll tell you this much. I don't think Tibbs is the happiest camper in the world. <laughs> I mean, is he ever, but yeah. No, I don't think he's I don't think he's the happiest guy ever. Like Tibbs is the ultimate if you can walk, you can play guy, you know? Uh and and I I really am never going to as a reporter question a player's injuries. I, and uh, I, there, I didn't, there are I don't want to imply there are, I want to be should. clear about that. No, yeah. I want to be clear about that. There are there are disastrous examples of that in sports, which we can go back to in a million different ways. I mean, there's, there's times where guys have not been feeling well and have literally had life threatening situations because they got pressured into playing, you know, there's, there's Joel and B getting pressured into playing because everybody thought he was soft for sitting out this year mm -hmm. playing in the next game and then tearing his meniscus in that next game. I mean, like, 
I, I, you don't know, like I, I haven't seen the medical reports. I I'm not him. I don't know what, what these guys are feeling. And I think OG Ananobi is a competitive, successful NBA player. And I think Julius Randall is really ravenous to keep playing. And I'm not questioning that, but I do think Tibbs mm-hmm. is like, okay, come on, <laughs> come on. Here we, here we go. Here we go. Come on now. Let's go. Our, yeah. our, I'm sorry. Like, do I feel a pulse? I feel a pulse. Oh, my, Miles McBride is averaging 45 minutes a game over the last two and a half weeks. Yep. Why don't uh, there's a pulse there? That means you can move. Yeah. So I, I do think that's just Tibbs's personality. That's just, he's just, if you can walk, you can play. And I'm not saying there's like a rift or there it's, it's a, it's a problem. I just, I think there's, there's, he's not the happiest guy about it because I think he also saw what, what they looked like in January. And I think he was like, Oh yeah, this is good stuff. Uh, well, and he I may not. Bad. Yeah, no, I may not have ever believed that their window was like genuinely like, and when I say like windows open, like, I don't know, what is an open window? Is it, you have a 5% championship chance like 10%, 8%, I don't know, whatever whatever the number is. I the, the, I never got to the point where the number was like that high for me, mostly because of Boston, but also because of like the West and just like, you know, like Milwaukee, like just, they still exist. Like for all those reasons, we don't need to get into them right now. But I'm sure Tibbs would have loved, would love to get his chance to to ride with that squad again and, and thinks that they could beat anyone. And he, listen, he might not be wrong. Um, I mean, look. Also, let's let's run through this really quick. Can I can I do an activity that that you? Oh my God, you'll love this. Oh boy. Oh, you'll love this. How many? You look at the coaches at the top that, that are coaching the teams that are above the Knicks. Okay. And and Tibbs is capable of out coaching basically all of them in a series. Like I really like I really like Joe Missoula. I actually think he's an extremely good coach. I he's the first name that came to to mind. He could definitely outcoach Tibbs, but Tibbs could also outcoach Missoula. Yes, because uh, Tibbs is a really good coach too. I think Tibbs can outcoach Doc in a series. Sure, we saw we saw Tibbs wipe the floor with JB Bickerstaff last this year. Is accurate, and I think Jamal Mosley is a very good coach, and he's very smart. And that dude has potential, like to the ceiling and that team is insanely well coached. However, he's literally never coached a playoff series before he's young. Like he's and his never, team, he's never done it. And his team with the exception of Joe Ingles, correct me if I'm wrong, has never, Oh wait, no, Jonathan Isaac, I think he played some playoff games back in the day. So it's yeah. Isaac. And, but if we're talking just like on the coaching side, it's like, yeah, sure. Like, like I, I don't think there are like the Knicks might be able to overcome a small talent discrepancy in the series. If Tibbs just waxes the floor with JB Bickerstaff again, you know, like I just, I, I, I think Tibbs really believes. In, I think everybody there really believes in the fully healthy version of this team. The, the vibes in January were crazy. They were so bought in everyone. I think Randall was so bought in. You like, can I, can I shout you out? You had a line on your, it's not the most recent episode of Cast and Shoot, but an episode within the last week where you talked about like, it, it actually brought me, you talk about Randall when he saw OG come and saw what he's like, oh, this is what basketball can be like now. You know what it reminded me of? It's not, it's definitely not apples to apples, but there was like a story about after LeBron, uh, the Cavs had traded for Timofey Mozgov where LeBron like saw him walk into the room and the dude was huge and was like, whoa, it reminded me of that. I wish I could remember who the hell wrote it or said it or anything. But what, you said that. And I was like, I, I was, I had to stop for a second. I was like, that's awesome. Yeah. I think, I think he just saw that and was like, Oh my goodness. This, I think he felt what tons of Knicks fans watching it felt. Mm. He was like, this is unbelievable. It's like, I can't believe that I'm a part of this. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah, neither could we. Uh, and that team was rolling. Uh, so I think, I think there's a lot of belief in that locker room if they can get healthy. Like I, they are not going to doubt confidence. And I 
don't think it's it's a cocky locker room either. So I don't I don't see them getting overconfident, but they just need to be healthy. Like this version of the Knicks can beat the Magic, but can lose to the Magic. The healthy version of the Knicks yeah. shouldn't lose to the Magic. No, 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 no. And and I'm gonna um, bring up something that if if I was smarter, I probably wouldn't because I just went on the put back with Ian and and Brian Windhorst, and I was like, I other than the Magic, I don't think I would pick this version of the Knicks team against another team like that they would be likely to face in the playoffs. And Brian was like, I think they would this version of the Knicks would beat the Cavs. So I'm gonna ask you that question. I think they could beat the Cavs. To be very clear. If you were giving me like an even money bet, I, I, I mean, I'd probably just stay away from it. But I don't know how comfortable I would, I would feel. Do you think this version of the Knicks, no OG, no Julius, can be the Cavs? Would you pick them? Well, this version of the Knicks isn't just no OG, no Julius. It's also Isaiah Hartenstein playing twenty five minutes a night. Mitchell Robinson, and Mitchell playing. Robinson playing ten or fifteen, and he's and not looking Preci- like Mitch yet. Right, and and Precious Achua playing eight minutes at backup center against Mobley and Allen. I, I I don't think this version of the Knicks would beat the Cavs. The Cavs are, the Cavs are too talented. And I, I know the Knicks just, just killed their bigs last year, but that was, that started with Mitchell Robinson. It wasn't only Mitchell Robinson. Hart was awesome on the boards and all that. That started with Mitchell Robinson. If he's playing 15 minutes, if Hartenstein's playing 25, that's a, that's a big difference. I also think the Cavs are way better this year than they were last year. Even though the record is not particularly different, uh, they've they've sustained some injuries. I think Jared Allen is a is a better player than he's ever been. Yep. He has been great this year. I think Donovan Mitchell really figured some stuff out when Darius Garland was hurt. Uh, I think the ball is going to be a little bit more in his hands. Him initiating offense. I think that's yep. a that's a good thing for them. Max Struess, even though the shooting numbers are not where you would hope they would be for Max Struess, has yeah, actually been a, he's been really good for them. He's been a really good connector. Uh, they they are playing good basketball, and I just don't think after last year they'll come out in a playoff series with the same energy. Like they're. They they might not be the most physical, brutish team in the NBA, but they're NBA players. They got embarrassed in a first round series last year. These are hyper successful, self made people who have competitive streaks. Like they got embarrassed in a first round series last year. They, they more likely than not, they're going to learn from that, and they could lose, but. I don't think they're coming out with the same energy intensity. I don't think Jared Allen is coming away from another playoff run saying the lights were too bright. I don't think, I don't think that's happening. So I, yeah, I would, I would pick Cleveland over this version of the Knicks. The other Presuming, version of the Knicks, that's yeah, a different story. That's a different story. Presuming Mitchell's knee is okay, which is the, that's the thing. Brian brought up, but yeah, presuming presuming Mitchell's knee is okay, which we'll, we'll see whatever. We'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, I, I want to I want to hit on a couple of things before we go to, but just I, before I want to leave the the injury stuff behind. Again, I'm asking you to guess. You've implied it many times. Like all we could do at this point, given what we've given what we know, and given what the Knicks have said, and more importantly, what they have not said. I'm going to ask you to guess. Do you think we see OJ and Obi on the court before the end of the regular season? This is a guess. It's a guess. It's a guess. This is we, not me reporting anything. anything. Yes. This is not me reporting anything. My guess is that both OG Ananobi and Julius Randle will play before the end of the regular season. Yeah, I think Ananobi will come back before the end of the regular season. And my guess is that Julius Randle will will play. Okay. I he is going through this rehab and from how it's been described to me it sounds unbelievably painful. And he's been going through this treacherous rehab for over two months just so he can come back and help this team. And I just feel like every single person involved in this process will be like, well, what a freaking waste if we don't just give it a try. Uh, Now, now again, yes, I'll have the medicals. 
The doctors may say, yeah, you'll give it a try. You're going to dislocate your shoulder in three minutes, and then you're going to need massive surgery and it'll ruin your career. You know, that maybe that's the case, in which case I'm wrong. That's why I'm I'm guessing. But I feel like if Randall is on the fence, if they're in a place where it's like, Julius, can you, this is about if you can withstand the pain. Can you withstand the pain? It is going to feel like you're being shot every single time you post up, but can you withstand it? Then I think he plays. That's just how he carries himself. Then I think he plays. And and Ananobi, I just I just have to imagine he returns. Um uh, sorry, I know I said those last things. But again, John, yeah. to be clear, to, I don't know. I don't know. Nobody all, knows. No That's because it's knows. all that's because it's all medical. Uh it's all medical. Right. That's what I should have said. I should have said it's all medical. Next time. Um, yeah, I now nah, you know what? I'm even going to ask an offseason thing about OG. We have the offseason to deal with what happens to with OG in the offseason. Um, you wrote uh, a great piece after Jalen Brunson's 61 point game in San Antonio. And um, I seeing the on off number doesn't make it as stark as you put it. When you wrote, they outscored San Antonio by 22 points during the 43 minutes that Brunson was on the court. And in the 10 minutes, he rested. 10. It was 10 minutes, he said. <laughs> they outscored the Knicks by fucking 26 points. 48 point swing in one game. I don't think I said uh, fucking. No, you did not. I think the athletic probably would have had uh, maybe your editor or whatever would have. Would have, would have, my would editor have would have been like, you. did John Macri write this for you? <laughs> I actually, do, I try really hard not to curse in my newsletters. I try. I fail sometimes. Like today, I failed. <laughs> um, so that was, and then you you also wrote another story that I, I realized we hadn't had a chance to talk about on how the Knicks bench has been just, you know, obviously a, a massive problem and they did not solve it. Like even as Deuce McBride is doing incredible things, like they did not solve that that issue, um, certainly with the trade and everything. Um, last night, are you are you taking a positive from what we saw from the from the non Brunson minutes last night? Do you think that do you think that is irrational to do so? Yes, against the Heat. Well, kinda. Okay. Kind of. There's one thing that I think we can take away from the non-Brunson minutes, and it's not the score. The score means nothing to me. It's one game. He didn't really hit shots in those moments. Uh, yeah, it just it doesn't really do anything for me. It's one game, and we've seen such a large sample of them not being able to score without Jalen Brunson. Okay. And Bogdanovich was, was really hitting shots. Maybe if Bogdanovich starts hitting shots at that rate, which is possible, like it is he, possible. he can do that, then then maybe there's something different. The one thing that I will take away is that Tibbs was staggering Dante DiVincenzo to play with the bench unit and waiting until Jalen Brunson came back into the game to bring in Alec Burks. And that is the one thing because that's an operational change. That is That is something that we hadn't quite seen. I am like, yeah, give it a try. See what it's not working. He knows it's a problem. He knows when you ask Tibbs a question about a flaw on the team, he will almost always disagree with your premise because he just doesn't want to throw anyone under the bus under any circumstances in a public manner. He never wants to do it. And so he will say time and time again, net rating is the most important stat to me. It's the most important stat. Net rating is so important to me. It's the most important stat out there. And then you'll be like, hey, Tibbs, this guy's net rating this season is really, really bad. What do you think is going wrong there? Do you think that's or do you think that's representative of reality or whatever? And we'll say, well, the thing with net rating, the problem with it is you really have to. It, it, it's devoid of context. You know, you don't know the other players that he's out there with. You don't know this. You don't know that. And then, and then it'll be, well, you know, Josh Hart is amazing. Look at his net rating. My yeah. goodness. And so it's, he never wants to throw any, and to be clear, this is not a criticism that there, I, there I are, like there are lots of players who have, I've spoken to me about 
how much they love that about him. That like he will always take it on the chin for every single player and how much they like that. So that's not a criticism. Do I wish he would be more honest for my sake? Of course. And do I wish, do I wish that like he would be more open so I could, I could like learn and we could all learn and that, that would be great, but it doesn't, it doesn't upset me at all that he does that to me. There are, there are unnecessary lies and there are necessary (laughs) spins because to him more important than me is his players. And that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. I don't think the list of priorities needs to change, but he knows it's a problem because I have asked him about it and he hasn't shot down the premise. He's just been like, yeah, you know, here's the thing. We, you got to rest Jalen sometime and we just got to do better in those. That's what he said. It's like, you got to rest Jalen sometime. I'm like, my goodness. Am I encouraging Tibbs to play his stars more minutes? His tips being like, well, you're crazy, man. This guy can't play that many minutes. Like, <laughs> it's like, got to rest Jalen sometime, and we just got to pick it up in those minutes. It's like, he knows there's a problem, and now we're seeing, not just now, like we are seeing in his actions that he's looking for solutions. I am intrigued by that. Because they were okay in the non-Brunson minutes last night, I wonder if in the Sacramento game on Thursday, on Thursday we see a similar sort of thing. where. Even Chenzo is going to play with the bench unit. Maybe we see similar kinds of lineups. Uh, I I could I could see it. So that's something that's something I I take away. His substitution patterns last night were interesting. Like I was surprised he closed with with Achua. <laughs> I was going to bring that up. I thought it was more just like they wanted to switch more, and Achua was maybe a better switch guy than Hardenstein. Think- I think that definitely had to do with it. I also, again, I wasn't there, so I didn't have a chance to ask him. I think also just just knowing Tibbs, and he did make the comment after the game about them just not being good enough on the boards. Yeah. I think he was probably rebound. very, yeah, I think he was Season probably low. very frustrated. And Mitchell Robinson and Isaiah Hartenstein combined to get two rebounds. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, one offensive, right? It was one offensive rebound. Yeah, but two total rebounds. That's crazy. Those are two great rebounders. Yeah. So I think, I mean, Hartenstein had one off, one rebound in, in 18 minutes, and it wasn't like he was like blocking everybody out and everybody else was grabbing boards and he was being a great team rebounder. I just thought he had, he's had an off night on the mm-hmm. boards and Bam is really tough. And I thought he was pretty good defensively, actually, on Bam. He did a really good job getting physical with him, but it was just sometimes that can distract you from getting rebounds. And, and I, I wondered like a Chua Hartenstein is a negative rebounder. He'll, he'll box you out, carve out space and find the ball. A Chua is a positive rebounder. He'll leap over you. The box out doesn't really matter. Yeah. And, and he's just like an energy guy. He'll just keep jumping. And so I, I, I wonder if Tibbs was just like this, our, our our negative rebounders are not are not working tonight. Let me go with a different style rebounder. And and Achua was getting boards. I mean, he had he had the big back tap, which yep. then led to a miss, and then he had the tip in. Yep. Uh, he he was he was doing better on the board. So I wonder how much that contributed to it as well. I, I don't even really. I know he had the the foul on Rozier, which was a really bad yeah. foul, but I wonder how much. Yeah, I, 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 I don't even hate. I don't hate the decision. I, I understand it, but I wonder how much of it had to do with, with the boards, also. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that was one. That was certainly an interesting thing. And then the other talking point for a lot of people after the game was Josh Hart, um, staying out and playing so many minutes, even though he was like actively looking not to shoot, which clearly hurt them and hurt their ability to to generate good offense and made the Miami's life easier on defense. I wonder if there's something up with him because that was like, I know the guy's not, um, you know, gunning it like uh, Dante DiVincenzo, but like three shots in 46 minutes is like, that's not very many shots. He loses confidence in his play. I don't know if it's something up with him. He just, he just loses confidence in his jump shot. I have spoken about it with him at some point probably next week. So I'm going to do it before the season ends. I'm going to write a little something about Josh's. He has this one type of jumper 
that every time he shoots it, I'm like, no, that is a horrible shot. And basically every time it goes in where he, where he drives left, gets to about 12 to 14 feet. Okay. And then he shoots a little step back mid range shot yeah. from the short mid range. And every time he shoots it, I'm like, that's a horrible shot. And it, and it goes in and I was talking to him about it. And he was really honest with me being like, I'm like, why can you shoot that? But you can't shoot an open three. He's like, sometimes I get the ball then wide open and it's just like, I'm just like, okay, my elbow's got to be in place. My, my hands got to be in place. My form's got to be perfect. I have to be technically sound and on that play. It's like, I'm driving. There's a guy in my face. I don't even think about it. I just shoot. And it was, I really appreciated his honesty. Cool. It was, it was very illuminating. I was hearing it. And the whole time I was just thinking about Chuck Knobloch. Oh my God. But he can, he can lose confidence in his shot. Uh, he was, he was saying, maybe I just need guys to, to just close out on me really hard and I'll shoot better. That's uh, interesting. But, but I don't know. That's the reason if I'm playing the Knicks in the playoffs, by the way, I might be Andrew Bogut, Tony Allen, Tony Allening him after that, just sag, sagging right off of him and, and letting him shoot just because he, he will lose confidence in his shot that way. You, you wish he wouldn't, but I think it's sure. just, it's just part of his art is game. I don't think anything's up with him. I think he just probably wasn't feeling good with the shot and he just totally got away from it. Cause there were times where it's like, he's at it six was, feet. Yeah. And he wasn't even looking at the rim. I know. Yeah, it was. I, he was, I, he was like, driving only to pass. He was driving yeah. only to pass. When you drive, when you drive, your in, your your objective has to be to score. When you drive, your objective has to be to score, and that is what creates the pass. Yeah. If you're driving to pass, especially when Miami is playing passing lanes the way they were, Miami was being like, "Oh wait, what if we don't even guard the drive? What if we just stand in the passing lanes and there's just nobody even in front of them?" Mm-hmm. And so Josh was jumping up being like, Oh God, I can't shoot. I think he must've thrown. I mean, it's not like he never tries jump passes, but he must've tried eight jump passes in that game last night. Yeah. And he's driving and he's just throwing it back out to the top of the key and they're starting over. And he was getting, he was getting flustered. And I think he just, he loses that confidence. But, but this was, this was the thing I said, um, I've said in relation to a bunch of guys before, but when you drive, your objective has to be, to score. And that's not selfish. It's just, if your objective is not to score, then they're not going to guard you to score. And the whole point is the defense has to be worried. You're going to score because if they're not, then they're not sending help. And what's the freaking point of the drive? (laughs) So, so if you want to drive to pass, you have to drive to score. It's one of the many ironies in basketball. And he was just the ultimate definition of driving a pass in that Miami game. Hopefully it's a one game blip and he gets back to at least like his normal level of like, yeah, if you're open within 10 feet of the, the hoop, you, you shoot it. Um, before I let you go, I want to ask you about Deuce and Pride because you, um, after his rookie season, right, right, wrote what I think you know, might be my favorite piece that you um, have written so far since you've been covering the Knicks at least um, on Deuce and his relationship with his brother and his relationship with um, you know his dad and like what it's I, I'm not gonna I, I don't want to spoil the piece it's something that everybody should go and read for themselves because it was just really really good so I feel like you maybe his have brother, little... his brother was so funny for that story his brother's ad on Twitter too. In addition, but yes, his brother was funny for that story. His brother was his brother is very funny. He is very funny. He was trash talking the hell out of Deuce. Is- there was some stuff that I didn't even put in the story because it like wasn't quite relevant. I'm trying to remember what it was, but it was it was just so funny. Like he just he literally accepted the interview because he said it was an opportunity to publicly embarrass his brother. Like he. <laughs> He was like, yeah, any opportunity to publicly embarrass my brother. I'm in. He, he was, he was hilarious. That was a, that was such a funny interview. I was laughing the whole time. Well, it, it showed through because it's a, like I said, it's great. It's a great piece. And if anybody, I mean, it's just relevant today. It's probably actually it might be more relevant today than it was even then, because back then Deuce McBride was coming off a rookie year in which he had played 300 some odd minutes and like 
you know, we did a couple of nice things and like got some people excited, but like there was no, at least I did not get the sense having seen him shoot under 30% from the field that this was a guy that was going to figure prominently in New York's plans moving forward. And now here we are. And, um, I like I I think of Benji's voice whenever I say this because I he's I think he's the first person I like remember saying it like this Deuce McBride thing like the thing that is happening like it is I don't know that I can remember anything quite like him transforming and maybe that's the wrong word and that's kind of what I want to ask you about like but like did you see this coming you know what what are you what do you make of this and yeah that's what I want to ask. Yeah, I totally saw this coming. Who wouldn't have seen this coming? <laughs> You're funny. When you criticize seen... this contract after he signed it. <laughs> yep. Who wouldn't have seen who wouldn't have seen Deuce McBride averaging entering the starting lineup and averaging 20 a game on 51 46 94 shooting while also playing legitimately phenomenal defense the entire stretch. Oh, and also just playing entire games. Just not even sitting. Who would have yep. Who wouldn't have seen that coming? So maybe it was a stupid question. It, it was not maybe. It was a stupid question. But like, <laughs> no, I did not. It wasn't a stupid question, and I and I I did not see it coming at all. Okay. Uh, this guy has improved so much. It is an incredible story. Is. He has from going from second round pick to shooting under thirty percent as a rookie to. Really struggling on offense last year. Yeah. To struggling off the bat this year and just not playing at all. To honestly, to the organization has has been behind him the whole way. And at times I've questioned it. Like I know, I know of teams that have called up the Knicks about McBride, not now, yeah. but during his rookie year and his second year. They called up the Knicks and were like, What's your what's your thoughts on McBride? And and they were just like, no, no, we're just not no. discussing McBride. Just no, no, just we're not we're not discussing McBride. They really had that approach with McBride and Jericho Sims. They were like, we're not discussing Sims too? McBride. Yeah, they were like, we're not trading those guys. Interesting. And hmm. and it always surprised me that it was like that stern. You know, I was like, but you won't. And and the other team's reactions were like, well, why don't why don't you play him? And you knew Tibbs was a big McBride guy too. And I think they just. They saw future returns coming in. I, I, I think they just they, they saw him turning into a legitimate player. I think Tibbs saw the shooting for sure. Tibbs was telling people behind the scenes for a little while that like the jump shot is way better than it shows in games, and it's going to come. Uh, Tibbs was. I wrote. I wrote about two months ago a story about how they're tracking in their practice facility. McBride had over the last year or so become like the best, one of the best three point shooters in their in their practices and in shooting drills and that kind of stuff. And Tibbs was like, "This is going to show up in games at some point." And and he was telling, he was he had a lot of faith in that. And so Tibbs has been pushing this for a while. And I do think one of the reasons that the organization wanted to open up minutes for McBride with the Ananobi trade was because Tibbs was like so on board with that. Like Tib Tibbs, Tibbs saw McBride becoming a real rotation player. What I certainly didn't see was him becoming this, not just this level of rotation player, but even in this style. Where it's like, I thought if he was going to become a rotation player, it was because he would have had to learn to like create separation off the dribble somehow. Yeah. You know, I thought he was going to have to, cause he, cause, cause his biggest offensive problem was, was as much his inability to get by guys to create his own shot as it was just the pure shooting over his first two years. And he has completely adapted his style. And by the way, because you know, be playing basically as Benji has said on this podcast, more like a wing on offense than like a, than like a point guard, even though he's the size of a point guard. And for what it's worth, because the league has noticed like, Oh crap, we can't leave this dude open. Yeah. Guess what's happening. Guys are closing out on him harder. And yeah. now he's able to attack. Now his shooting is what is creating more space for him off the dribble. And I think he's playing with so much more confidence. 
Oh yeah. So much more confidence. He is just playing with so unbelievable amount of confidence. I, I, I just, he's playing. It's, it's honestly one of the most impressive development stories. I think that I've covered in my nine years as a beat writer. That's why I really think so. Like it's, it's, it's so impressive. It's, it's an incredible story. He's legitimately good. And there's like, there's just, you just, it, we went from even like three weeks ago. Yeah. No, we were talking about their play. We were talking about their playoff rotation as like, yeah, you obviously can't play Burks over McBride. So like maybe McBride gets eight first half minutes and maybe he doesn't play in the second half, depending on the game. When night. it's like, no, no, like McBride needs to play. Yeah. Like you got to find play time for McBride. This dude is good. Yeah. He is legitimately, he is, he is a good, maybe really good player. He is good. On both I'm both sides. Yeah, no, I'm excited to see where it goes. I mean, the movie put on we fake Kevin Love out of his shoes first, and then I mean, essentially crossed up Jimmy Butler to get that dunk last night. And um, yeah, I don't know. I said it a few days after the Spurs game. Like, I know he missed a shot that would have won it, but I thought it said a lot that Brunson passed it to, like, trusted him to to take the shot, and that he. He took it without his take. He could have passed it to Bogey there, and we could sit here and quibble like, oh, "Should he have passed it?" I love that he took the shot. I know he missed, and I know the it was a game. perfectly good shot. He was open, and he's it's a forty three percent three point shooter. Yeah, he's 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 open, catch and shoot for forty three percent three like forty three percent three point shooter. He should act like it, and he did. Yeah. Like, don't 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 confuse um, uh, shot hunting with selfishness. Yes. yes. You can, if you're a really freaking good shooter, you should shoot. It's actually selfish to, it's selfish not to shoot. Yeah. That's what I keep, you know, I, there are, there, there's the occasional complaint about like Dante DiVincenzo, like putting up however many shots he's putting up from three. Like, and I may, just my opinion, it's like he needs to do this. It would be a bad job if he did not shoot when he had room to shoot because he has the third most. Yeah. Also, because he has no inhibitions, it makes him a better spacer. If he yes. occasionally passed up those shots, guys wouldn't yep. close out on his hard and they wouldn't stick to him as hard. Yep. But because he puts up all those shots, guys are racing out to him. So yeah. it has. So those shots, even if sometimes they don't go in, those shots have actual tangible effects on all the ensuing possessions after the fact, which completely outweigh the fact that he might miss them every once in a while um all right frederick matthew cats uh i'm putting you on the spot before i get you out of here what seed are they going to finish with uh, this is obviously hard reporting from you there's no guesswork at all all right I'm pulling up all the schedules that's exactly what i'm doing so i'll i'll set the stage while you're doing that um, so the Knicks obviously don't own the tiebreaker against the Magic. They don't own the tiebreaker against the Pacers. They do own the tiebreaker against the Cavs, but the pesky Cavs are now a game and a half up. Um, the Magic have what I would define as a the most interesting schedule remaining because they have two games left against the Bucks that are their um, third to last and then their final game of the season. It's very possible the last game won't matter for for Milwaukee. Um, we'll see if the one on uh, their third to last game matters. And in between those is a game against the Sixers. Um, we're obviously recording this on Wednesday. We don't know whether the Magic are going to beat the Pelicans tonight in New Orleans. I think that game will go a long way in deciding the final seeding. Um, you know the Knicks schedule, I'm sure, by heart. And then uh, what else should I read off here? The Maybe the Pacer schedule? Who's more interesting to you to, to, as far as pos- potentially catching the Knicks? Pacers or the Heat? Pacers. Because they have the tiebreaker. Pacers have the tiebreaker. Pacers and they have, have this the game against Brooklyn tonight. After that, though, I'll, say, yeah. I'll just say the Pacers schedule here. Thunder, Heat, at Raptors. So you figure that's probably when. At Cavs. See what that matters. That Cavs. Heat game is in Indianapolis, right? That is in Indianapolis, and it will decide yeah. the tiebreaker. Yeah, so I I think I think I would say Pacers for for that 
that that puts him over the top for I would say Pacers, but I don't think the Pacers are going to catch the Knicks. Okay, I do. You, and you then I, just to be clear, I, you don't think the Heat are going to catch the Knicks either? No, I don't. Okay. That would take a lot. I, I I agree. I also it's what makes it really difficult to project is that it's possible that that Boston game in Boston, the third to last game of the season. When Boston has everything clinched, it's possible that Boston is like, we're playing our starters three minutes or we're, or we're sitting everybody tonight or whatever, like resting guys for the playoffs because they got everything clinched. And it's, it's possible that that's the approach that they take. And all of a sudden that goes from an unbelievable, like the toughest road game you could possibly play to a gimme. Uh, So that, that, that makes it tough. You know, I'm going to say Knicks get the four seed. Really? I'm going to say they beat out Orlando. I'm actually surprised. I I projected, I think, earlier today that they would finish fifth. Um, yeah, just be- they they might. I, fi- I I have no idea, John. I don't know that I care I'm that saying much. the four seed. I have no justification or logic. Yeah. I, I mean, look, it, home court advantage matters less against Orlando for them than any other team in the league. I had a crazy, and again, this is was like like one in the morning, and after I've been talking for way too long, after one, of, I forget even which fucking game I was saying it. But like, could you make an argument that not it's better for the Knicks to not have home court advantage, but like Magic coming out on their home court, all the pressure in the world, and the Knicks are just like, hey, let's grab one of these two games in what is essentially a home arena for us. Uh, yeah, it, it'll be it'll be seven home games. Yeah, it'll be seven it's for real. It'll be seven. Oh, home yeah. Games. It's, yeah, that's what Orlando is. Yeah, seven home games. Mm-hmm. So that, that's all it is. So, okay. so I think, I think it doesn't matter as much. Definitely four or five. I don't think they're going to catch Cleveland at this point. I don't think so. Uh, I, I, yeah, I guess maybe five. I don't know, John. I don't know. Four, but four or five. Okay. No, it's just four. That's, that's, four. I'm going to say four. I'm going to say okay. four. Okay. I'm going to say four. You say four. I say five. Um, this is your, normally when I would call up um, Andrew Claudio to do some banter before uh, I let you go, but he is off recording a pregame pod with what looks like the, the someone with the Deuce and Mo podcast. Is that what that says? Do you, do you not see what I'm seeing on the screen? I can't see anything. So just for anybody listening, Andrew had to leave in the middle, in the midst of producing this episode. And, and I don't even know if he realized. Oh, the this. deuce and Mo podcast. So he's got there the pregame, is. the pregame show banner at the bottom. Yeah. He switched the banner about 10, 15 minutes ago. I don't even think he realizes he did this. Um, I certainly don't, don't care. And I, I wonder if he cares. Um, so he's ostensibly, I think, recording that now somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so I won't call him up to, to say anything. Is there anything you want to say behind Andrew Claudio's back before you go? Uh, yes. Just that he is wonderful. <laughs> the best. Nick's film school is lucky to have him. Cats and shoot is lucky to have him. He's officially my, my full-time producer now at cats and shoot. I'm thrilled with it. He's incredible. So uh, just that he's wonderful and that we are unbelievable just pains to him all the time. Like people don't even know what unbelievable pains we are to him. They, you people have no concept. Like you couldn't. They, possibly they think it's have. just during this hour that we're talking. No, it's we're really not. Time. It's not. <laughs> um, and that is he's like he's about. like your like full time life CEO and coach. Oh, I can't fucking tie my goddamn shoes. <laughs> it's <laughs> like raising your children. <laughs> people uh, this is not an act folks uh actually some people probably think it's the worst in real life which i am um fred you're incredible um you uh i'm excited to to read uh some of the stuff you have in the pipeline um i saw you use some of the hartenstein quote in the story today i'm, I'm trusting more is on the way yeah, I think I'll have I have a quote that made John have to change his pants from Hartenstein about Tibbs. And so I uh not blue balled on that one. I was not blue so I was yeah, I had to go change. And uh yeah, I, I think I didn't put it in the story from today because I would like to save it for another thing that I'm trying to figure out if I can work on, but it's so beginning stages of it that I don't know if I'm gonna do it. I don't know if I'm gonna like it. I, I'm 
I'm, I'm, it would be a Tibbs type of thing, but I'm, 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 I'm putting out feelers and seeing if that could be worth it to run leading into the playoffs. And, uh, I've got, I've got a, I got a story on Lou Dort coming out tomorrow for those who are just NBA fans and, uh, want to uh want to learn about that and i'll have obviously lots of nick stuff coming out in the next couple of weeks and then uh you know ton of stuff in the playoffs playoff previews all whatever else and of course if you're not already subscribed to cats and shoot uh on patreon you can't get it anywhere fred <laughs> you can't get cats and shoot patreon.com slash cats and shoot you can subscribe there there it is. That is had, had Sam had Sam Marill on the podcast this week, who was was awesome. I mean, he's just legitimately one of my favorite stand up comedians. So I was so I've seen him a comedy seller so many times. So I was I was so excited. He's a huge Knicks fan, so I was really excited to have him on. Uh, and then uh, yeah, more more stuff to come. More stuff to come. Um, Maybe a John yeah. Macri appearance. You never know. Uh, you never know when you're going to run out of guests yet again and 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 pick up the phone. Um, but I will be there happily, uh, ready to come on. Um, thank you, Fred. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Even though you're not here anymore, and thank you everybody out there for checking out another episode of the Next Film School podcast. Uh, lots of good stuff coming your way the rest of this week, so be sure to check all that out. And um, in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your week. We'll we'll be back soon. <laughs>